Ten years ago today, New Democrats gathered in Hamilton to select a new leader, and they made history. For the first time ever, they chose a woman to lead their party. And we welcome that woman to TVO, a decade later, to consider the impact she and her forces have made on the province of Ontario over that time. And with that, we welcome the leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition and the MPP for Hamilton Centre, there's Andrea Horvath. Nice to have you back here at TVO. Thank you, Steve. It's my pleasure. Happy anniversary. Thank you. Happy International Women's Day while we're at it, too. Oh, I appreciate that. I want to go back 10 years. Shall we start there? Okay. This is what the first ballot results looked like in Hamilton 10 years ago today. Sheldon, if you would, bring the graphic up. And there's you. 37% of the vote in first place, 10 points up on Peter Tabbins and Gilles Bisson and Michael Pru, all of whom were uh, fellow caucus members at the time. You want to see what you looked like 10 years ago? You Did came I in, have to? Well, <laughs> I won't you me. came in for an interview shortly thereafter to talk about uh, the victory that was to come on the third ballot. And uh, let's have a look at what you had to say. Okay. The clip, please, Sheldon. Tell me about that day. What's your strongest memory of winning? Uh, the strongest memory was actually the first ballot. Uh, I didn't expect to be as far ahead on the first ballot as I was. Uh, and it was a thrill, and I knew when that first ballot came in that it was likely going to end up the way it did. So it was, uh, it was, it was absolutely thrilling, to be honest with you. Ten years later, what stays with you from that day? Um, I think what stays with me was, it was the energy of our campaign, and that that energy, uh, I think, caught hold of the membership and, uh, and pushed us through to the, uh, to the winner's circle. And, and I, I think that, to a large extent, that energy still continues to to be part of who I am and uh, what we're feeling in our party. You had only been an MPP for five years at that That's point. True. And you were running against people who had, um, well, who were older and had more experience, both in, in life and in politics. How difficult was it to be actually seen as the leader from that moment on? Well, you know, it, it's, I just I just wanted to say that I, I don't think my experience was all that less than the other men around the table. It's just that men's experience tends to get more attention than women's experience. But certainly electorally, I had as much experience as, for example, Peter Tabbins, more electoral experience considering my city council days uh, than Mr. Bisson, for example. Uh, and age-wise, you know, I was, uh, I'm just a couple years younger than, uh, uh, than Mr. Bisson. You seemed um, younger. Uh, yeah, well, you know what, it was, I, I certainly hadn't been an MPP as long, mm -hmm. although I was an MPP longer than Mr. Tabbins. And so again, mm -hmm. there's this history that speaks to um, uh, a, a, a reality that I don't think is, is particularly accurate. Having said that, though, um, I, I think that, um, that our, you know, our, our time together as colleagues, as MPPs, um, shifted a lot when I became the leader. And it was um, each person that was in the leadership race um, reacted differently in terms of how we were able to move forward after mm -hmm. that. And so as, a, as a, a young woman leader, if you want to put it that way, uh, I, I think people were excited, but it was also a shift. It was a shift for our caucus, which was a small caucus. Let's not forget, mm -hmm. there were four um, MPPs out of 10 that we had in the caucus that ran for the leadership. So mm -hmm. there was some healing that had to go on and some, uh, you know, some, uh, you know, rearrangement of uh, people's egos and all of that. But I, I think we, we did all right, uh, all told. I think we did well. I do want to pick up on the gender issue because I do remember in, in, after you won, there was a big scrum, of course, all the reporters yes. descended on you to do a scrum. And I remember remarking about seven or eight minutes into that scrum that no one had asked a question about the fact that you just made history. Mm. No, there, there were no questions about how does it feel to be the first woman leader of the NDP ever. W was that not as big a deal, I guess, to you at the time as maybe it ought to have been or as, as well, no, observers and, thought? No, in fact, I thought it, I did think it was a big deal and, um, and I still do think it's a big deal. Uh, I think it was a big deal when um, I, I became the second only leader of a, uh, an official political party in, in Ontario. Uh, it was a big deal when Kathleen Wynne became the first premier, a uh, woman premier of Ontario. I, uh, these are our moments of women's history that I think uh, we need to pay attention to and, and acknowledge and celebrate. How much sexism was there for you on the job 10 years ago when you first got it? Uh, I would say there was uh, definitely sexism. I would say that there definitely continues to be sexism. Is it better today? Um, I mean, I, I guess uh, in, um, incrementally it's gotten better. Uh, I think awareness has been raised uh, in a, uh, you know, across the political spectrum uh, where that probably wasn't the case 10 years ago. Uh, having said that, um, it was, it, was uh, I mean, it goes back to even the way that you described, uh, you know, the contenders in the race, right? Mm. Back then, that's what the narrative was. I was, the, you know, I was the most inexperienced. 
because that's the assumption as, as a young woman that I would be the most inexperienced. And that's how history talks about it and describes it, but that's not the, that was not the case. Uh, again, I think maybe 10 years later, in a similar, similar situation, perhaps those assumptions wouldn't be being made, uh, but there still continues to be you know, challenges as, as a woman in, in this particular arena. And I don't think that that's you know, unique. I think many uh, arenas, whether it's business, whether it's politics, uh, whether it's community work, it, it continues to be an issue. I think you, you rightly point out that many people who follow Queen's Park didn't take your municipal political career into account when they were saying sure. how much experience you did or did not have. Mm -hmm. But having said that, your you know, 26 premiers in the province of Ontario over the last 151 years, only one woman, and it wasn't you. How disappointed are you by that? Uh, well, I, you know, there's always next time. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> Is there next time? Oh, absolutely. So you're hanging around. Oh, you better believe it. You I, I, I still have the fire in my belly, and I still have a lot of work to do, I think, uh, to realize some of the vision that we have for Ontario, particularly for the people of Ontario. I don't have to tell you, it, it is... I mean, it's pretty rare for party leaders ever, to be sure, but, but in this day and age in particular, to hang around for four general elections. Mm -hmm. You are committing here today that you will be running as the NDP leader in the next general election. Well, as you know, the democratic process in my party is such that it's up to the membership to determine that. Uh, but certainly, I believe I have a lot of... Um, um, you know, a lot of energy left and a lot of vision left and a lot of uh, a hope for the future. And I think that's what our last campaign showed as well, is that it doesn't have to be this way. We, we can actually make life better for everyday families. And that's my passion. It always has been. And uh, I, it's not waning. Let's put it that way. Here's the record of Andrea Horvath as the leader of the NDP in three general elections. Sheldon, let's put this graphic up. You came in, 2011 was your first election as leader, 17 seats. 2014, up to 21 seats. 2018, up to 40 seats. Um, obviously, it's all going, in your view, in the right direction, but what's your view of that seat count total? Well, you know what? Uh, I made some commitments when I first became leader about what, uh, what I would do to, um, to bring our party to a place where we could uh, actually implement uh, the changes that we think are necessary for Ontario to do better for everyone. Uh, and I think I've, I've been able to do that. I mean, we've, uh, we've doubled, more or less, doubled the seats twice. Uh, from, uh, from when I was first elected, there were only 10 caucus mm -hmm. members, and uh, now we're up to 40, which is fantastic. We've achieved official opposition, which hasn't been done for us in a very, very long time, uh, with a very strong bench, which is excellent. But our party, importantly, has also changed. We've, we've opened up our party. We have far more young people involved. We have uh, a greater amount of diversity. Uh, we do have 40 caucus members, but both this election campaign and last election campaign, we were able to achieve 50% women uh, on our bench, which is an amazing thing. And, and to be honest, I was a bit worried this last campaign uh, because I didn't want to see us lose that 50% women uh, uh, cohort in our in our uh, caucus, and we were able to maintain it. Uh, and it's it's a it's a fantastic uh, um, it's a fantastic achievement, I think, and one that really shows that if you are serious about bringing uh, women and uh, and people from all kinds of diverse uh, backgrounds uh, to elected office, it's achievable. You just have to be serious about it. You've done it twice, I think, right? Yes. The previous caucus was also 50-50. Yep. Uh, okay, all of that having been said, and fair enough, it's all fair points. Um, th I, th I think the conventional wisdom out there is that your best chance to become premier and to form a government happened in the last election. You had the liberals decimated. You had the progressive conservatives with a brand new leader who had only been on the job for three months, for goodness sakes. Um, and it didn't happen. You had a shot and it didn't happen. Do you think you've missed your best chance to become premier? Oh, absolutely not. The way that it works usually in politics is the official opposition is the one that's in line for government. Uh, and so uh, I think that's something that we have to acknowledge in terms of history. Uh, and, and, and look, you know, I think that uh, people were very, very disappointed with the Liberals. There's no doubt about it. Everything from leaving our health care system, you know, dangling on a, a thread uh, to, uh, you know, challenges in the education system and, uh, and autism was another issue that they didn't uh, get right. But, but look, uh, the gas plant scandal, the cash for access, People were very, very disappointed with the Liberal government, no doubt about it. Um, but when it came to the election, uh, we went through a, a campaign that we brought forward something that was very ho hopeful for the future of Ontario, fighting for everyday people and making life better for them. 
At the end of the campaign, when we had the premier say that, uh, the former premier, say that the best bet was to vote for the Conservatives, that was pretty, that was pretty challenging for us. I don't and, think and she said that. Well, pretty much. Uh, she trusted uh, Mr. Ford over uh, the NDP in, in terms of uh, 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 being able to deal with the She's uh, not the here, province. but I don't think she said that. Well, again, I mean, <laughs> if you can look back at the, uh, at the last week of the campaign and you can see exactly what happened. But the, but the bottom line is this. It was, it was the wrong thing to do. And we now have a government that's dragging us backwards. So for as much disappointment as people had with the Liberals, uh, we're going from bad to worse. We're going from bad to worse with the Conservatives. And I think Ontario families feel that and they see that. And that's why they're fighting with us as the official opposition against things like the draconian changes to the autism uh, uh, system, uh, support system, and uh, fighting with us to prevent the gov uh, government, conser Conservative government, uh, from privatizing our health care system. I mean, there's a lot of pieces that people are seeing that they didn't, uh, vote for in the campaign uh, that the Conservatives are now implementing. You, you do have a different role in this Parliament, obviously, than you did in the previous one, Absolutely. where you were the third place party and really didn't get that as much ice time as you clearly do now. You are the official opposition leader. Mm -hmm. And I guess there's a view that, you know, obviously the opposition is supposed to oppose, that's part of their job, but, but there's a fine line to be walked because you don't want people to get sick and tired of seeing sure. you up being relentlessly negative all the time. We talked about that 10 years ago. Uh, what kind of opposition politician you intended to be. Here's what you said back then. Sheldon, the clip, please. I don't have to tell you that many people thought your predecessor, Howard Hampton, while they respected him on many fronts, found him to be loud and sanctimonious during question period. Mm -hmm. Do you plan to be loud and sanctimonious during question period? I don't think I have been so far. I'm trying to be, <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's, uh, it's an interesting process to get up every day and, and hammer the government mm -hmm. in, terms of, uh, in terms of criticism. So I'm trying to find a way of, of uh, bringing forward the issues that's, that's serious, uh, that at times are passionate, uh, but, um, but I'm trying to find my feet and I'm hoping, uh, hoping I'm doing an all right job with that. How do you think you've done on the loud and sanctimonious scale? Uh, well, I mean, these days I'm getting pretty loud, uh, but, uh, but we're also hearing a lot from everyday families who want us to be uh, pretty oppositional in terms of what this government's doing. Having said that, we're also pr uh, propositional, and, and we are still bringing many uh, private members' bills and ideas into the legislature, and during our debates uh, we're talking about uh, how things can be done differently. Um, during the process of the legislating, legislation going through the House, we're also proposing proposing amendments uh, to try to make some of the legislation that this government's bringing forward better. And so we're doing all of those jobs. Uh, and again, there are going to be times when uh, when we may agree with the government and, and actually name, support them. one time. Uh, I'm, I'm actually trying to, I'm, I'm, I'm digging as, into my as brain. As soon as it was out of your mouth, I thought, <laughs> wait a second, I'm going to call her on this because I, I, I know that we actually, one. I know that we actually have, and I, and I can't uh, at this moment think of it. I should have had my staff <laughs> remind me. Uh, but, um, but you know, it, it's, it's one of those things that you have to be uh, cognizant of. Is it, is people expect you, yes, to, uh, to uh, fulfill that role as the official opposition and, and criticize the government and, and be that, um, you know, that uh, keeping their feet to the fire kind mm -hmm. of role. But at the same time, um, people want hope for the future. Uh, and, and us, uh, you know, putting forward ideas, things like uh, ph uh, pharmacare program, uh, things like uh, making sure that our uh, healthcare system remains uh, in public hands in terms of delivery of service, uh, not just in terms of the payment uh, of, uh, of services. I mean, that's, those are big, big pieces that people are concerned about. I get that you have to call them to account. That's part of your job. But do, do you also remember that they got more votes than you? They got a lot more votes than you, actually, and that they're entitled to bring forward their program and try to get it through. Oh, no, there's no doubt about it. That's how our, our system okay. of government works. I mean, they got 40% uh, of the people of Ontario mm -hmm. voted for them. 60% of the people of Ontario didn't vote for them. But they didn't um, vote for you. No, I, I understand that, but they didn't vote for them. And so we're, we're speaking on behalf of the 60% of people uh, that didn't vote for the government, as well as all of those people who are disappointed. Uh, disappointed watching Mr. Ford uh, return to cash-to-access fundraisers. Watching Mr. Ford appoint his best friend, or his very close family friend, as the head of the OPP, you know, watching Mr. Ford take out vendettas uh, against uh, his political foes, most, late, most latest of which, of course, is uh, uh, Brad Blair, the former uh, deputy commissioner of the OPP. Mm. So people don't like that kind of thing, and we are going to uh, hold his feet to the fire in that regard. Let me uh, take a step back here and ask you one of those real touchy-feely questions. There are lots of people... I'm a new Democrat. I don't know if I can handle that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only There's plenty of people out there who think that what you, and, and frankly all of, like all the other 123 of you down there at Queen's Park as well, they think that what you do for a living is really a giant waste of time. And they don't see the significance of it, and they think it's a big show, and 
they're not convinced it has any value at the end of the day. How would you convince people that after 10 years as leader, you think it's been meaningful work? Well, because we have been able to, um, I mean, from an opposition pers uh, perspective, we've been able to affect change. And, and whether that's, uh, you know, forcing the Liberal government to back away, for example, from cash for access uh, fundraisers, uh, whether that's, uh, you know, forcing the government of the day, which was the Liberals, to back away from increasing drug costs for seniors, uh, forcing the Liberal government back in the day uh, from uh, backing away from changing the special diet forms. That's when I was first elected, uh, which made it more difficult for people with disabilities to obtain the nourishment uh, and the supports that they needed. I mean, there are things that we achieve for everyday people. And although sometimes folks see it as a bit of a theater, uh, the reality is we, we work hard, um, not, not for, um, you know, not for the the show of it uh, and not for the fame of it or the glory of it because it's, it's inglorious at many times uh, but for, for, for you know for the fulfillment of um, of people's needs and and fighting for uh, what the people of Ontario need to have a better life here can you say though th that if if you don't get over to the other side of the floor of the legislature because we talked about I'm going to go back to 10 years ago we talked about the fact that you did not see the NDP's role 10 years ago as simply being the conscience of the legislature which has been its Absolutely. traditional role you want to win you want to get in there you want to be able to Absolutely. affect your program how, how disappointed are you going to be and how much will you feel unfulfilled uh, for yourself and for the province if you say you're going to lead the party again for a fourth general election if you never get over to the other side well, you know, again, that'll be the decision of the of the people of Ontario. But I think that we have already, uh, over these last ten years and before, uh, prior to that, uh, shown what it the, you know the medal that we have as a party in in trying to remind governments of what their job is, and then trying to uh, show the people of Ontario that we can do better. And uh, again, uh, whether that comes to pass in uh, three and a bit years' time, is uh, it, it will be the decision of Ontarians. But they have just been through 15 years of a Liberal government that ended up being very, very disappointing. Uh, and now we're being dragged backwards uh, by the current government. And I think in four years' time, or three and a, a half, a little less, uh, we, we're going to have an opportunity to show the people that, that it actually can be different. That you don't have to keep switching back and forth between Liberals and Conservatives, continue uh, to see life get harder and not easier, continue to see the folks at the top do better, uh, and everybody else do worse. And of course, we've seen the Financial Accountability Officer bring a report very recently that showed exactly that, that in the last decade, those at the top continue to do better, and those in the middle are are barely hanging on and more of them are ending up at the bottom uh, than they are climbing to the top and of course those at the bottom are doing much much worse and that's with 10 years of a liberal government so I'm pretty worried about where we're going to end up in three and a half years time after this government government makes it even harder for everyday people to make ends meet you've been there for 10 years as leader but 15 sure. years altogether you're you're at the stage in life where a lot of people start asking themselves what else is out there are you asking yourself those questions? Well, you know, I, I think because we've now achieved the uh, official opposition uh, role, uh, it's it's a whole new ball game again, and it's it's a different uh, a different scenario. And it's we have forty amazing MPPs that represent all parts of the province, and so in some ways, it's a bit of um it's a bit of a um, an interesting situation where although it's technically the same job, if you will, leader of the uh, NDP in, in Ontario, uh, it, it's changed considerably over the years. And, and now in this, uh, in this particular moment, it's, it's completely different again. And of course, the Premier is completely different. So that's a whole other challenge. <laughs> Here's what you said in your victory speech 10 years ago. We're going to bring an excerpt up here. The middle class is disappearing and the working class is largely unemployed. We could accept this and adjust. That's what the other parties say. But adjust to what? Growing unemployment lines and growing food bank lines? Adjust to this growing discrepancy? Adjust so that those who stole our money can get more out of it? We refuse to adjust. How much of this is still true a decade later? Well, unfortunately, much of it is still true, although we might not see the same levels of unemployment, but what we see is underemployment. So we see a lot more precarious work. Uh, we see a lot more young people that aren't able to find jobs in their field. We saw, see a lot more people taking two and three jobs just to make ends meet. Uh, and at the very last minute, uh, the outgoing, the, the former government was trying to address some of those things, uh, as I think a Hail Mary passed in the, uh, in the uh, up, up 
swing to the campaign. Uh, but we see this government, you know, it's going to take us backwards in that regard. And so although at that, that time we were talking about the steel mills, uh, Stelco particularly mm -hmm. in my town, uh, you, you know, closing up or the potential of uh, many, many jobs being lost there, we're seeing it now in the auto industry. I mean, look at what's happening in Oshawa. I want to ask right? you about that. Let's, in fact, let's finish up on that. Hey, your dad worked at Ford, did he not? He absolutely did, Ford in Oakville. And yeah. your brother at Toyota? My brother currently works at Toyota in, uh, in um, Woodstock. So the auto industry and the Horvath family have a lot of history together. That's so true. Okay, so you know the lay of the land. Yeah. Do you think this province is going to have to just get accustomed to the fact that we are not going to be the players in the auto industry that we once were. No, I think that's a big mistake, as a matter of fact. And, and we were quite crit critical of, uh, of Mr. Ford in the way that he handled the Oshawa announcement. And of course, we're seeing now in the States, particularly in Michigan, uh, where they did the opposite of what Mr. Ford did. They actually fought uh, from, from the get-go. They fought for those jobs. Uh, they, they said, hell no, we won't go. Uh, and, uh, and as a result, there's some hope now in Michigan that their plant is going to be uh, a bit of a saved. reprieve. A bit, a bit of, of a reprieve. reprieve. Yeah. Whereas here, um, you know, the Premier and the Prime Minister of our country uh, both um, almost immediately said, well, GM said that they're leaving and so they're leaving and there's not anything that anybody can do about it. So you don't put up the fight, you don't keep the jobs. The other thing is, I'm quite shocked at how uh, much, um, how, what a lack of vision, I guess I should say, that this Premier has when it comes to the auto auto jobs of the future, uh, the automobiles of the future. I mean, we do a lot of the IT work. Uh, we do a, a lot of, uh, of that, um, that kind of technical uh, work when it comes to those uh, vehicles. But I, I, I don't see any plan whatsoever uh, to uh, have the assembly and manufacturing of those vehicles of the future being done in Ontario. There's no vision uh, and no plan. And I think that's a big mistake. One last touchy-feely question. They say that when you spend a lot of time in opposition, it actually gets soul-destroying. And I, you know, I was having a chat with uh, the finance minister, Vic Fideli, the other day, who said that had, had he not, had the Conservatives not won this election, and had he finally not had the chance to move into government after all of the years in opposition, this would have been his last term because he just couldn't take it anymore. You ever feel like that? Oh, I don't give up. <laughs> I, I appreciate you don't give don't up, give but, up. <laughs> but, but, but a normal person would say after 10 years, 15 years, sorry, on the opposition benches, <sighs> Come on now. Well, you know what? If you be if you believe what you're fighting for, and and you know, especially now when we've seen a change in government, uh, and that change being one that's going to drag us backwards, uh, when we have this great bench of uh, of MPPs that are so excited and that are so um, invigorated and and chomping at the bit to make a difference in people's lives, uh, it, it it's re-energizing. It, it actually it makes it that much more important than that we're there to uh, to fight this fight and to. Uh, and to take this government on, because the vision that they have for Ontario uh, is not going to help everyday people, notwithstanding how much they pretend that it's going to, we see the opposite happening. You know, parents of children with autism are left on, on their own, pretty much. Uh, we have these um, announcements around you know, potentially very harmful cuts to our schools when already we were seeing cuts to our schools. Uh, we, we see a healthcare system that's going to be in upheaval and who knows uh, what's going to end up uh, happening to patients and families who need healthcare in the interim while we tra transition into you know, whatever this government has in terms of a vision. You know, all of these things, they don't make me feel uh, like, like it's just too hard of a, of a journey or it's too tall of a, of a wall to climb, quite the opposite. It, it's, it, it's all of those people saying to us uh, that are fighting with us uh, that together we're the official opposition. So it's yes, it's the party and yes, it's the uh, caucus members, but it's also all those parents. It's all those young people. It's all those students who are fighting for a better post-secondary system. It's all those uh, f uh, you know workers who want to see uh, you know, hope for the future for themselves and for their kids and for their grandkids. That's Andrea Horvath, the leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition, and uh, 10 years ago today was elected leader of the Ontario NDP. Thanks for coming into TVO tonight. My pleasure. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.